Stanford University. Okay, thanks, Misha. Um, actually, I will talk about handouts quite a bit, but um, when I was asked to give that presentation, I had to do some thinking. Um, what works well in my class? And so I was looking over past course evaluations and I talked to students in office hours. And I realized a lot of that had to do with learning materials in one way or another. And so I decided, well, that might be a good topic for the presentation, in particular since nobody has talked about it so far. So this is, this is, um, this is the main topic. Um, I see many of you look like uh, graduate students or beginning instructors, and so maybe you're contemplating your academic career. And um, you're thinking, well, now this is Stanford in the middle of Silicon Valley. Um, and you might think, well, that kind of maybe commits you to kind of a high-tech um, high -tech teaching style. Maybe you should do that. So this is yet another, another reason why it's maybe worth investigating what's effective and what is not effective. So I also have to say there's a little bit professional interest in that topic. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm a statistician. I'm doing academic statisticians. I, I'm also uh, teaching a big undergraduate class, Introductory Statis Statistics, Stat60. Um, that class can have over 200 students, and it's usually a requirement for, say, uh, majors in human biology. And it meets five times a week at nine in the morning, which students like to point out. Um, it's not my, I cannot change that, but actually it fits quite well into my schedule, but not in theirs, but that's, that's another topic. Um, and so I have to teach various introductory statistics topics. And recently, over the past years, the graphical display of data has actually emerged as a more active field of research in statistics, in particular with the, uh, with the prominence of the internet. It is important how to present data well. And it is actually, you can actually research on that and there's some research done. And when I teach that class, I spend you know, maybe a lecture or two talking about that. And so that has some connection to what I'm doing. And I actually want to start out with an example that I give in class, and it's an article from the Stanford Daily. I like to use articles from the Stanford Daily. And so it talks about, uh, about donations to private universities. And this is an article from 2002. And essentially it, it says, well, uh, private gifts reach an all-time high. And it, essentially the article is about three numbers. It's about uh, the donations in 2001 to Harvard, and to Stanford, and to Columbia. And so the donation to um, to Harvard is 469 million, and Stanford got, um, no, Stanford got 469 million, Harvard 683 million, and Columbia uh, somehow in the 360 million. And so they compare this, and then at the end, apparently the editor says, I want to have a graphic. And so there's a graphic there. And I put this up as kind of one of the worst graphics ever I've ever <laughs> seen. And if you look at it a bit, it's maybe a little bit hard to see in the back. You, you probably see what the problem is here. But first of all, you might say, well, this is, these are three numbers. Do we need a graphic for three numbers? Um, well, probably not, but if the editor insists, it has to be put in. The, uh, it is true in general that people like to look at figures. They do not like to look at numbers. They like to look at figures. In general, it's good to, to put a graphic in. So, so that's true. And so then a graphic was put in. And actually, the graphic makes it very hard to compare these three numbers. You see, it's a three-dimensional graphic, which you do not need. Three-dimensional graphics are actually useful for complex data. But here, you just have three numbers. There's no need for a three-dimensional graphic. The problem is that when you look at it, your brain tries to perceive volume. <laughs> and it turns out the brain is not good at that. Actually, research has shown the brain is not good at that. Now, in fact, you notice that what it comes down to is the height of the blocks. So essentially, you have to compare the height of the blocks. But then there's a perspective in here. And it makes it difficult to compare the heights of the blocks. Well, for that purpose, they put a grid in there where you kind of can refer the height to an axis. But now the grid slopes downward because of the perspective plot. And so in the end, it's very, very difficult to actually compare these three numbers. So why did the reporter put that graphic in there? And I think the answer is because he had the software to do it, and it <laughs> looks cool. Okay. Um, incidentally, when I, 
first did this in class, a student raised her hand and said, actually, I'm the reporter who wrote that. <laughs> so now it turns out she is the, re so Kristen, Kristen Schleicher, so she wrote it, but she didn't do the graphics, she wrote the text. The graphics somebody else did, so that saved the day. Um, <laughs> so anyway, you might ask, actually, how would I do that correctly? So um, I mentioned people have actually been doing research on that, and essentially they did experiments to figure out what your brain is good at perceiving and based on these results, they came up with various graphics for various situations. And for that situation, they said the best graphic looks like that. It's called a dot chart, um, essentially. So here's a, a, a chart line for Columbia, one for Stanford, one for Harvard. And you can compare the lengths by kind of referring it to an axis. And they think this is, um, this is the best way to represent those data. I like to point out you can do that by hand. <laughs> Okay, in fact, I did it by hand. You, all you need is a ruler. So in this case, the most effective way is actually the most low-tech way. Okay, and so uh, that, that turns out to be also true for some teaching material, not for all, but for some, and I will get to that later. Okay. So what, what works well in my class? There are three or four things which I want to talk about, and the first one is the handout. And uh, when I look at course evaluations, talk to students, that is mentioned over and over again. Um, the handout, they, they seem to like very well. Uh, what I mean with handout, it's kind of a lecture note. I, um, I write down essentially a summary. Yes. Okay. Okay. As ill-efficient at conveying information as the 3D box plot is, it sort of looked pretty. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, okay, correct. Okay, you get uh, okay. Um, so, when I talk about handout or lecture notes, what I do is I, I write down a summary of what I'm talking about. Say, if it corresponds to a chapter in the book, I would write a summary of what I um, what I talk about. This will turn out to be a bit more than I than what I would write on the board if I decide to write on the board or if I use transparency or so PowerPoint and have students uh, copy that down. So it's, it's a bit more, it's a bit, it contains a bit more, but it's still a concise summary of what I want to talk about. So, so the feedback I get consistently says, this is really important. And now when I ask, well, why would that be? Well, maybe I should check the literature. Maybe they, what, what does the literature say? So when I came to Stanford, at some point, I was uh, given a book, uh, Tools for Teaching, by Barbara Davis. And actually, I read through the book over the years, from beginning. And so I, I, I look up, so apparently I think it's, it's considered to be a good book. And so I, I looked up uh, what, the, uh, what the author had to say about handouts. And indeed, there's a chapter about instructional media. And so they have subchapters on chalkboards, flip charts, transparencies, slides, films, computers, and multimedia. They don't talk about a handout. So it seems there's really some gap in there, and it's, it's worth talking a little bit more in detail about the handout. So why do you think it's effective? Um, first of all, clearly, um, students can concentrate on understanding what's going on. They do not have to spend their time copying what's written on the board or on transparencies or in PowerPoint. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I spent my time essentially writing in lectures and learning at home. And you now with a handout, you know, you give students the freedom to actually concentrate on what's going on. Um, I tell my students that you may want to add some information on your own in the margins. Actually, I leave some blank spaces in there. So that, that turns out to be useful. So you know, follow what the instructor is doing and add your own stuff in there. The second uh, point is that, in a sense, the handout is a contrast 
to the book. Um, now there's this Chinese proverb which says, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. You know, if you, if you think as kind of hearing, maybe going to the lecture and hearing the guy and seeing, maybe reading a book or the handout and doing, maybe do an experiment. And so you can associate it with, with the learning process. My experience is that actually different permutations of that proverb apply to different people. So I mean, some people tell me, well, I really need to go to lecture and kind of listen to what you do. And others say, well, I really learn best by reading, reading in a book. And others maybe learn best by doing an experiment. So, so the lesson is different people have different styles of, of learning best. And, and there the handout is just a fourth component. So you have the book and maybe the book is quite big, maybe has many examples. And for some students, that's exactly what they need. Um, for other students, maybe a more concise statement is a better way to go. And so it just adds this additional component to accommodate different people. And so I think this is one reason why the handout works well. So I remember when I was um, in high school, I saw a movie about school 100 years ago. And so it would depict kind of, you know, there's a big classroom. There were no grades. There was just one big classroom. It was in the village. There was a small village school, one big classroom. And all, all kids were in that classroom. And then the teacher would start in the morning and say, OK, you and you read that chapter in the book. And you and you do that math problem. And you and you learn that poem and so on. And I said, well, what an advance. Now actually we have grades and you know, it's much better. Now my kids go to school. Um, and so I found out, so they go to the Los Altos School District, and I found out, well, starting from fourth grade, when it's time to do math, actually the, the kids are sent to different grades according to their abilities. Okay, so they leave the grade and move to, to a different grades according to their abilities. So in a sense, we have been moving back to what happened 100 years ago in, in, a, little, in a little way. And I'm told, well, the ideal situation is that every student has an individual curriculum. That would be the ideal point. I think that's the current art of research, that it would be ideal to have an individual curriculum. Now, universities have actually been quite good at that, historically. I mean, you know, if you're an undergraduate, you can, you can finish your studies your studies in three years, if, if you're fast. You can even go to a, a master level class, a PhD level class. I mean, some classes, of course, have prerequisites, but essentially it comes down to persuading the instructor to let you in, and you know, you, in the end, it's gonna work out. Um, so it, historically, universities have been very much accommodating of different learning styles and different speeds in learning. So uh, I know, for example, Pat Supis in philosophy had, uh, has this, uh, this program for gifted youth. And so he once told me there are eight-year-olds taking physics classes here at Stanford on, online, I mean, distance learning. So, so universities have this tradition of really allowing a very much diverse learning style. So the question is, how, how does that work on a smaller scale? So now, suppose you're in that course, so you, you take that course, and how would how would you accommodate different learning styles within that course? Well, so as we mentioned, some students might find it helpful to go to a lecture. Some might helpful to see experiments. Some might, it helpful, might find it helpful to have a book with many examples. And some ch just find a, a concise description in a handout more advantageous. And, and so the handout is just a very effective addition to the other means that are already there. So, so this is my take on the handout. It accommodates different people, or for, this, for one student, it may be useful at different stages of the learning process. So they might start out reading a book, many examples might, might find that helpful, and later on when they prepare for exams, maybe the handout becomes more helpful. So this is one explanation why I think um, students like the handout. Another point is, um, if, if you're a little bit interested in teaching and you ask, well, what's really important to students? What is the most important criterion that, that students value most? You will find in the sciences what comes up, it's clear explanations. I think you know, that comes up over and over again. Uh, if students ask, what's the most important thing? Well, the instructor has to give clear explanations. 
So a few years ago, the Senate decided that every department should start a training program for TAs. And so it mandated that departments institute such a program, and the departments have to designate a faculty member in charge of that, and so I was asked by my chairman to do that. So I prepared a training program, and we met at one point, and I, have to, I think, well, what should I tell them? And then, well, of course, you know, it's most important to give clear explanations. So I was standing there and telling them, the most important thing is that you are clear. And immediately, the question shot back, but what does it mean to be clear? <laughs> you know, well, that's actually a very good question, because I never thought about that. Because, you know, I knew it's important, and my evaluations generally say, it's nice, he's very clear, so there's no work to be done. So I never thought about that. But now I had to, and well, you know, let's let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this tools for teaching book. What what do actually what do what do they think? What what is a clear explanation? So if if you look in the book, it lists three main things: focus on fundamentals, create a sense of order, don't give many exceptions to general rules. So if you think about these three things, these are exactly what are required if you write a handout. So you have to focus on fundamentals because it's a concise statement of what's going on. Um, you don't want to put in many exceptions, the general rules to keep it concise. So in, so in other words, it, uh, the handout helps to give clear explanations. And it also, it forces you to kind of think about it in a clear way. So I, I think that's yet another reason why I think the handout is very helpful. Now, if you look at a textbook, for example, if you write a textbook, well, it's a scholarly piece of work. And there's some demand that it be complete. I mean, textbook gets reviewed by your colleagues. Um, you know, you might, you put your scholarly reputation on the line and you may think, well, you know, it better be complete. So if there's an exception, I you might know, better put in the exception and the footnote, just to, you know, better do that. Um, so the textbook is actually a compromise. And the handout does not have to be a compromise. So you can just leave away those exceptions. Nobody wonders about that. Another point is that the handout gives students a better idea of what's important. Um, what I find again and again is students have a hard time, when they read the book, they have a hard time actually seeing what's important. And I think instructors do not really, uh, it's difficult to understand because you know the subject very well, you know what's important, what's not important. But for students that can be quite difficult to distinguish what's important and what's not important. And the handout does a much better job in that way than the book does because it's more concise. Uh, a final point is that I think books are becoming less practical. What do I mean? Well, recently I found in my mailbox a book, a statistics introductory textbook, which was sent by a publisher for review. That's, that's it. It has over a thousand pages. And I have to say, about 10 years ago, most books would have maybe 400 pages. And, well, why is that? Um, if you follow the news, you see that the textbook business has been in the news over the last year, repeatedly. Uh, there are complaints saying that the uh, textbook publishers push new editions without cause. Um, they require authors to kind of add material so they can bring out a new edition and charge more money for it. And in a sense that, you know, the emphasis is not, ne not necessarily on what's good for the learning process, but you know, it's, it's a commercial business. And now textbooks cost well over $100. And if you go to the bookstore, you buy a book, you buy this one, you have to pay $120. Well, at least, you know, you feel you get something for your money. I mean, you have to admit, you know, <laughs> it has, it's weighty. So you, if you get something for the money. Um, in contrast, I brought a book, which I like very much. It's not a textbook. Um, it's called The Prime of Mathematical Writing, and it's, it's it was, it was written by Stephen Kranz, and it's published by the American Mathematical Society. It's essentially a book to help junior researchers and PhD students 
kind of the master, you know, how do you write a letter of recommendation and stuff like that. And it's, it's a very good book. And it's a very thin book, and I think it costs only $25 or so, because that is essentially non-profit. It's published by the American Mathematical Society just for the purpose of helping the young researchers, and there's no commercial interest in there. And while you cannot possibly ask $120, $120 for such a book. So clearly, the publishers will try to move the authors in that direction rather than in that direction. Um, now, books are also, I mentioned before, books are a compromise. Um, books are not really optimized towards the learning process. So for, what do I mean? So um, what's the most important part of the book? Well, the tables of contents and the subject index. Because every time you use a book, you know, you have to get to some page in the book and first, you usually have to go through the table of contents or the subject index. So these are the most important parts of the book. And so you might think, consequently, they should put on prominent, page, prominent places and they should be easy to access. So maybe you want to even put it on the cover of the, pay, of the book. So that would make it easy if the table of contents is on the cover and you can you just look it up and immediately go to the page you want to go to. This is not how books work. So for example, if we look at the Tools for Teaching book, um, then um, you know, there's the title and the author, and of course it has to be on the cover. Now if you open the cover, it's blank. <laughs> the next page is also blank. Okay. Now let's turn over to the next page. It's blank. And then Tools for Teaching, so that's the title. We, we knew that already, but <laughs> it's, it's again there. Um, then the next page, the author name again, well, we knew that again. And the next page, just in case you forgot, it's now, <laughs> it's now screaming at you, the, the title is there. And then on the next page, there's some information about the publishing house, whatever. And then it says a publication of da-da-da-da-da, and you don't really care about that. And then another blank page, and then on page nine, the table of contents. So what they did is they wasted the, the first eight, eight pages, the most valuable part of the, the most valuable real estate of the book is essentially wasted or filled with redundant or, or not useful information. So now, of course, there's another issue to the book. I mean, there's an aesthetic point to, to a book. I mean, if you write a book, you want it to look nice. You want to give it to your parents, maybe to put it on a shelf. And so, um, you know, you, you don't mind this. You know, it looks, makes it look dignified. So it's just, you know, there, there's another aspect of the book, but it just reinforces what I mentioned earlier. Books are a compromise, and handouts do not have to be a compromise. And so this is clearly one advantage. Okay. Now, how about technology in the handout? So um, I... One option would be to put a handout on the web so people can look at it on the web. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I want the students to have the handout in class, and I find the only way that works is if I put it in their hand at the beginning of the lecture. Okay, so this is actually what I do. In the beginning of the lecture, those who are already there, I, I give them the handout, and otherwise I put a pile at the doors, and so students that come in take a handout from the pile. And I think that's the only way to make sure that students have a handout in their hands. If you put it on the web, you might say, okay, there's a wireless and they can look at it on their laptop. Well, some students do not bring their laptops and they cannot look at it. And even if they do, well, it's hard to add anything to the, to the notes then. And so I feel that, you know, I really, the only way to get, to get this done well is to really give it into their hands when they come to class. In a sense, the, the handout reminds me of the piston engine. So, you know, recently, there, if you read the news, there's a lot of talk about, well, cars have to be more fuel efficient and we have to move to a hydrogen future. And there are some experts who, who say, well, that's not going to happen because if, if you look at the, at the history of the car engine, it's quite amazing that the piston engine 
is, is a hopelessly inefficient design. When I first learned how a car engine works, I, I thought that cannot be true. So there's this piston which gets accelerated and decelerated and accelerated and decelerated. It's just wasting energy. I mean, it cannot be true. But it has, you know, history has shown that there have been enhancements to the piston engine, like old cars used to have a carburetor, now they have an electronic fuel injection, which makes the car more efficient. And of course, the most recent enhancement is the hybrid technology, which recycles brake energy. And these enhancements have made it very difficult for new technology, even superior technology, to replace this old design. And so some experts think that's going to stay that way. So there will be enhancements to the piston engine in the future, which may make it very difficult for new technology to replace it. And I think it's the same with the handout. If you think about the handout, it's actually an ancient idea. You could have done this 100 years ago. Uh, and you might ask, well, isn't there a new technology which can do it better? Well, um, there have been enhancements to the handout, notably photocopying. Now you can uh, cheaply and quickly photocopy things, and it's easy to incorporate graphics. And these enhancements make it very difficult for new technology to beat the handout. And so I would not be surprised if 50 years from now, the handout is still the most effective thing to do. Now, I do not want to sound too critical of technology because the overall message is a good one because the conclusion is, yes, a very simple tool that's very effective. And that's a good message. And that's, that's the bottom line. When it comes to technology, another thing, of course, is essentially you need to have a backup. If you have a projector or something like that, and you know, the projector is blue, and it doesn't want to show what you want to show, you, know, you try several buttons, cannot fix it, then a sense of helplessness sets in, and there's nothing <laughs> you can do about it. So essentially, you have to have a backup after that, and you have to duplicate things, and that's clearly a drawback. Um, Actually, talking about this, right now I'm, uh, I'm in contact with people at, at coursework. I like coursework a lot. I, I think it's, it's a really great invention. Um, I mostly like it. Of course, coursework is not necessarily a teaching tool. Coursework is an administrative tool. But it, it's a great tool. Uh, the reason why I like it a lot, actually, um, is because if I have a large, a, a large class like Stat60, then Students will constantly ask me, well, you know, was my homework recorded correctly? And, you know, I had, you know, my TA gave me another point on the quiz. And was it really updated? So they're very much concerned about this. And I found myself spending a lot of time dealing with those things. And I, I consider it actually a waste of time in a sense. And, and coursework changed all that. Because coursework allows you to record grades in coursework. And the official, my official, records for grades are in coursework. And so now at the beginning of the class, I tell my students, make sure to check every day that your, your grades are all recorded correctly. Okay? So, and I'm not dealing with that anymore. It's makes, it makes a huge difference. Now it turns out uh, last year, somehow one student lost all the homework scores in coursework. And how can that happen? Well, we can reconstruct it because Stanford keeps backup copies. It was not a problem. This year, same thing. There was a student who got a C, sent me an email. It cannot be, I cannot have a C. How can that happen? We look in the record, and all the scores are gone. How can that happen? So I go back to coursework, and you know, they're investigating. And the, apparently, what they told me last week is there seems to be a system error which can do that. Maybe it can do that. And that's somewhat disconcerting, because you know, if, if all the scores disappear, of course, you notice. Like, the student got a C and expected an A, obviously. That, that will trigger an investigation, but what if only one homework score gets, disappears? Nobody notices. I mean, um, that's a problem. So, and you know, well, you have to be cognizant of that. That that can happen, and it's um, one has to keep in mind this is always a possibility. So, uh, what else did I find useful uh, in my class? A few years ago, I switched from midterms to weekly quizzes. Um, now, I grew up in Germany, and the German university system has the tradition, at least in the past had the tradition, then there's one big exam after two years, which tests everything during the first two years. And then there's another big exam after three years, which examines everything you did in the next three years. So now moving to weekly exams is quite a step, um, but it, it's very successful. Students love it. Why do they like it? Um, there, are, there are at least two points. Yes. Is it done in remote? 
Yes, in my large class. So every Tuesday in the lecture. So, you know, for a midterm, you might have to move to a bigger classroom because you want to space them with an empty seat in between. But for the, for the quizzes, say it's a 25 minutes quiz. I just, you know, I just do it in the class and then continue with the lecture afterwards. So why do students like that? Um, there are two main reasons. The first one is that it keeps them learning. Okay, so they say, actually, the, the, mid, the, the quizzes keep me learning. Because otherwise, if there's a midterm, they kind of tend to slack and off. And then when midterm time comes, then all the dorms are awake until 4 in the morning doing midterms. But the weekly quizzes, actually, it keeps them constantly learning. And students like, actually like that. They think it's, it's a good idea. The second thing is that um, it, it lessens the pressure on the exams. If you have one midterm, one final, there's a lot of writing on this midterm and that final. If you have weekly quizzes, like the last quarter I had nine quizzes, obviously if you do not do well on one, it's not the end of the world. And students like that aspect too. And, and so that's nice. Um, I allow students to drop their worst score. And, and that also helps. Um, now the whole thing is also good for instructors. Why is that? Well, if you have to make up midterms, actually it's a difficult difficult process, so you have to come up with 10 problems and every quarter you have to find 10 new problems. And, and they have to be good and you know, have to be appropriate. And it's actually, it's quite difficult. It's something that I guess most people dislike. Okay, you do not look forward to that. Um, if you have weekly quizzes, it's just four problems. They are somewhat easier. It's, you know, it's, it's a little chunk every week and it's, it's much less daunting. It's much less frightening. And so it's good for the instructor. Also, I do not have to deal with makeups. Um, if, you, you know, if you do a midterm, you have a class of 200, some inevitably will have to miss that midterm. You have to make a makeup midterm. Um, if you do weekly quizzes, there are no makeups. I'm not dealing with makeups. So if they have to miss one, well, there's one drop anyway. If they have to miss two, maybe out of health reasons, they just get another drop. So instead of nine, I count only the best seven, whatever. I give them as many drops as they need. I cannot do that if I have only one midterm. Because, you know, there's just one score, I cannot drop it. If I have nine quizzes and I have to drop two or even three, it's not a problem. I just average over six instead of whatever. So, so that, that's actually helpful. I do not have to, to deal with midterms, uh, with makeups. Um, maybe I should talk a little bit about homework. So if, if you're interested in teaching and read the books, you, you will kind of learn that um, it's a fact that students learn, m learn a lot from each other and they learn better if they do homeworks in groups. Okay, so I think that's, that's been pretty much proven. If they, if they work in groups, that enhances the learning experience. So there's a benefit to it. And of course, there's a problem also because you're supposed to give individual grades at the end of the quarter. And if you have them work in groups, you know, how would you give grades? So that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a problem there. And how do I solve this problem? Well, um, I allow them to cooperate. I allow them to do homework in groups. But in the end, the homework will not count much. I count, I count it only for 20%. Now, at this point, what helps is the GPA. So you may think that Stanford computes the GPA for up to two decimal places. That's wrong. Stanford students compute the GPA to six decimal places. <laughs> okay, why is that? Well, you know, students come to me and say, you know, I should really get another point on this homework. And then if I make a computation, what's the expected impact of this one point on their GPA? It's somewhere in the six decimal place. And so students compute their GPA to the six decimal place. And it's, in a, it's, it's a nuisance. So, you know, that, you know, that kind of striving for good grades. And I mean, of course, it's important. So I have a, a lot of human biology majors. They want to go to medical school, grade count. So, but I guess most instructors feel that, you know, that's somewhat an unpleasant aspect of the education. Except here, there's actually one point where it comes in handy. So even if the homework counts little, they still will do it. <laughs> because, you know, because they compute their GBA to the sixth decimal place, they will still do it. Um, now, of course, you might ask, well, you know, you, you want to make sure it's a fair assessment. So if they spend a lot of time on the homework, I mean, it should count correspondingly. I mean, yeah, that's true. But I see homework as a way to prepare them for the quizzes and for the final. I also give them the hardest problem I can find on the homework. 
Now, they might be an easy problem to get them started and to warm up, but the otherwise are usually the hardest problem I can possibly find I put in the homework. And it's, it's a very simple reason. It, this is the way they learn the most. I mean, like in sports, if you want to do well in competition, you have to train hard, and it's the same in academics. You know, if you want to understand things well, you want to do well on the final on the quizzes. You have to train hard, and the best way is to do hard homework problems. And then, of course, they can work in groups, and that helps if they, if they get stuck in, in problems. Um, maybe I should also talk about office hours. So when I, when I teach that class, it meets five times a week, and I usually have office hours every day after class, or, of course, by special appointment if the students cannot make that office hour. When I, either when I was in graduate school or when I came here, I somewhere read an article in uh, probably the student newspaper there was a story about a professor who told their students that they can call him any time, even at home, 24 hours a day if they have a problem. And it was kind of put in a, in a way that, you know, this is really, this is really great. <laughs> I do not think it's great. Um, if, you know, if, if uh, and I, obviously it's not great for the instructor, but also for students, I think it's not helpful for students. Um, so if you, are, if you are a student about to graduate and you kind of, you know, start your teaching career, um, I think this is not a good role model. Why not? Well, um, in a sense, it, you train students that way. You train students that whenever they need, they have a problem and they need somebody, you jump. Um, you know, after they graduate, they will find out that life doesn't work that way. And so you shouldn't train them that way. So that it's not good for students. It's also not good for you. Why? Well, once you start your academic career, you have to balance a teaching load and a research load and a family life. And so once you, you know, find that you have this policy and um, what happens is you do your research, you think about a problem, then a student knocks on your door and asks questions, so you have to answer the question, and then you go back to your research, and at that time you find, well, you probably have to back up, it takes another half hour just to, you know, to get to the point where you left off, and so you spend a lot of time on that. And then later on you find, oh, actually that time is missing in my research or, or somewhere else, and then you try to get the time back and you might find yourself skimping and preparing for the class, and now that's a bad trade-off. So you just spend time on one student, and you lost the time on 200 students, and that's, that's a bad trade-off. So you're doing bad deals at that time. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really okay to, to stick to, to regular office hours. Um, I have office hours every day, but not any time, and I, I think that's, that's a good way to deal with that. Likewise, emails, I answer my email every day, but not every hour. So once, you know, they, it was around 5 o'clock, they got an email from a student asking for, for, for a hint on a homework problem. I, I emailed back, I emailed a hint back. A minute later came another email from the same student about the next problem. And then I realized <laughs> that this student was, in fact, looking for real-time online help on the homework. And, um, and it's not a good idea. In this case, you want students to come to your office hours. You know, it's important for students to come to office hours. I think there's probably research that's shown that, you know, interaction, personal interaction of students and faculty is good. It is good uh, to have students come to your office hours. You want them to come. But now with email, um, if you answer emails quickly, what's going to happen? You train them. I mean, you know, Stanford is a big campus. If they want to come to your office hour, it's actually, you know, it's quite an undertaking. If their dorm is far out, they have to bike in, and it takes time. And now if you answer email quickly, the conclusion for them is, then, you know, if I, if, I, if I do email, I have a quick answer. If I have to go to office hours, it's a long way. So essentially, you train them not to come to your office hour. Now, that's not the outcome you want to have. So, so what I do, actually, when I get email is, actually, I wait a few hours before I answer. But I answer every day. Okay. So I, I give a timely answer, but not right away. Um, finally, maybe I have a little bit of time to talk about experiments. So I do a few experiments in class. Of course, it's, statistics is not a lab science, but you can do some experiments. And what are the best experiments? The best experiments are experiments you can, um, usually you find out from somebody else. Maybe you, you, know, you see another instructor at some other place has a great experiment, or they are kind of they are, they are, um, on the web, you find something. There's one experiment I came up with myself, um, which works quite well. It's about ESP. ESP stands for extrasensory perception. And so extrasensory perception means, you know, there's some people think that um, some, some people possess ESP so they can perceive things uh, in other ways than with the usual means of seeing and hearing. And so, so a typical example would be, okay, there's something in the room over there, and they would be able to tell what it is. And, and so some people, of course, think that's all black magic. It's sure, 
not, doesn't exist and it's not there. But the nice thing is you can actually do scientific experiments to find out. Okay, and so you can do some experiments like that. And, and there's one I do in class, and it goes like this. Um, I tell students, well, here's an envelope, and there's a number in, in the envelope. And it's, 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 uh, it's, it's either one or two or three or four. So I write these four numbers on the board. It's one or two or three or four. And then I put the envelope somewhere in there, and I ask them to concentrate for one minute really hard and, and figure out what's inside there. Actually, there, there's another envelope inside there, so the number doesn't look through the envelope. So there's actually two envelopes. It makes it a little bit harder, but it's still doable. <laughs> so, so they concentrate, and then after one minute, I ask them, so who thinks there's a one in there? And then a few people raise their hands. And who thinks there's a two in there? And then many more people raise their hands. And who thinks there's a three in there? And then many, many people raise their hands. And who thinks there's a four in there? And just a few people raise their hands. And at that time, people get nervous because you know, everybody says, many people say three. I mean, what's going on? It's just ESP. And, you know, I have a student um, come up and, uh, and open the envelope. And so students open the envelope. And so I'm going to check what's in there. And it's, it's a three. Okay, so what's going on there? Well, um, in fact, it's, it's a well-known uh, phenomenon. It's well-known in, in psychology that if people have to choose at random, they do not like to choose the extreme numbers. So one and four is not likely to be chosen. And if they have two choices in the middle, they tend towards the right choice. So those three is the most likely to be chosen. It has nothing to do with ESP, um, but um, it, it's, it's always a fun experience. I know that phenomenon, and that's why I put the three in there in the first place, because I also want to have some fun at nine in the morning. Um, the, uh, what's the lesson here? Well, this experiment is there do, usually I do this experiment when I discuss hypothesis testing. So essentially you want to test the hypothesis that students are just guessing. And we compute our test statistics and come to a conclusion, but it also teaches the lesson that it's actually quite difficult to do a good experiment. Because in that case, you know, there are all kinds of, of confounding factors that come in. And that's actually also a good lesson to learn in, in a statistics class. So that's all I want to talk about. persuasive argument for handouts, Gunter. Yeah. But in talking in the past to faculty in engineering, where handouts have been used for many, many years, it seems as though a lot of faculty run into the problem that when they use handouts, fewer students come to class, or the students who come to class seem to become more passive or less engaged. Yeah. And I'm wondering how, so some faculty have this elaborate formula where you, you don't put everything in the notes, so they have to stay yeah. alert. And how do you get around some of those issues? Well, um, I guess it helps not to put it on the web, because they actually have to come to the lecture room to pick it up. Or you know, for those who cannot come, I put them in the department in the box, and which is an inducement actually to come to office hours if they have to go there and pick it up. Um, you know, I haven't really encountered that, that, that problem to, too much, so um, I get still a good turnout. Um, I encourage students to add to the handout if they see fit. And some students, they you know, they they f they, they feel it useful to, to come to a lecture anyway. So I, maybe it's just um, yeah, I, I haven't had to fight that problem, so I can't really tell of any remedies mm -hmm. that one might have. Yeah. Well, it, when it comes to Covering the material, and how how long is a typical handout then for your lecture? It's about maybe four pages. It depends. So that's fairly detailed. Yeah, but you know there might be some pictures in there and stuff. Oh. So it you know, um, it, and maybe it, sometimes it covers more. You know, if I don't finish, then it goes into the next lecture. But I think three to four pages is mm -hmm. is there. Yeah. And you do feel students still listen to you and yeah, stay yeah, engaged. I, yeah, I actually do not have so far no no problem so far, and, um, but never know what happens in the future. So <laughs> so I might come back and ask for for advice. <laughs> yeah. So do you uh, do you get much student feedback uh, wanting more detailed handouts? So we ask um, for more? No, I mean there's there's always of course you know for. In a large class, you always get a feedback of the type. This book is really good. This book is really bad. 
and then this handout is too long, this handout is too short. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's difficult to make it right for everybody, but I think in general, they, I think the general tenor is that they like what they have in there. Yeah. I think one way to get around uh, the passivity issue with students sitting in class just getting bored because they have all the information in front of them is just to say it in a different way than it's stated on the handout. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with, yeah. um, with slides, you know, when people make PowerPoint slides and then read the points. One after another, I mean, there's no point. You can, you've already read it all probably in the first two or three seconds yeah. that it's up there. Um, yeah. So there's no point in saying yeah, actually, it. Actually, I might actually do that unconsciously for, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering uh, when you said that you've recently switched to the weekly yes. tests, whether you feel that uh, students are learning more, retaining that information because it's chunked and reinforced more. Yeah and that it, whether you've been able to correlate that and see the difference. Yes, so I, I, I do think when I, when I look back, I think students are doing better if I look at the final. Um, there, there's an improvement there. I'm, yeah, I'm quite positive about that. It, it does make a difference. I mean, I, I didn't do any rigorous study about that, but I think if, if one did it, I think clearly they, one would find there's a benefit. That's my guess. This is each discrete, though, or do they build on the previous? Topic? No, it, it covers, it covers. I tell them what it covers. It usually covers what it is in the previous week, and then on the coursework it will say it will cover chapter, 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 whatever. So I, I tell them what it covers. Um, there's also a little bit difference um, on the final exam. Actually, allow them to bring notes because you know, some things involve formulas, and I do not see a point of memorizing formulas. I mean, that's not the way life works. I mean, anyway, you forget them after class, and if you want to use it later, you would look it up in the book. And really, the emphasis is on concepts, on understanding, not on formulas. So for the final exam, they're actually allowed to bring two pages of notes, write down whatever they want. Now, for the quizzes, on the other hand, I do not allow notes. So at that point, no, I, they have to memorize things. But it's just a few lectures back. So. Robin. Uh, one question. Because of the way you use handouts, you've enabled yourself and your students to move away from the scribing that you talked about before, yes. where you're just taking notes and, and learning it someplace else. Uh, and the little bit of research on taking notes, because this is, this is a big issue for faculty. You know, when do you give the notes before, not on the web? You know, it's, it's a huge conversation on campus. Uh, one thing that seems to be true, and it may come up in your annotation, is that when students take time to write something on their own or translate it into their own words, what you just said, but they say it differently, uh, can be a very powerful way of learning in class. Uh, it might even beg the, the question of do we and should we give them time? Should we actually stop and say, look at your handout? Take a minute and, you know, yeah. do you do anything like that where... No, I don't. I, I feel students, they are, they are able to simultaneously read the handout and listen to me. I, somehow they are able to do that. Uh, I've, my guess is if I gave them time, they would do something. They would take out the laptop and surf the internet. <laughs> that's, that's my suspicion. I haven't tried it out, but that's my suspicion. So, um, yes. So um, I give pretty detailed handouts, but the class has such a big background and diverse um, knowledge base that they want, they want a textbook and they're comfortable with a textbook, but there isn't a textbook that fits. Yeah because it would be like five different textbooks and you know they get angry because you make them buy a hundred dollar textbook and only covers a small amount. Is there a way to combine or piecemeal together from different textbooks and still satisfy copyright requirements? Is yes, I think actually, you know, I, I wasn't sure whether I should talk about this when I, when I, when I So when I mentioned about this, uh, this big book, I mean, one idea is if you read the news and you read all this, uh, these stories about the anger about the textbook publishers, um, one option is that more and more faculty actually do their own course, course binder. And uh, I think that's, we're, we're moving in that direction. Okay, so students are unhappy to pay $120 for the textbook. Um, faculty are unhappy with the business, and I, I think the way this is going to be resolved is that more and more faculty will essentially do their own textbook by 
uh, combining things from various textbooks, pay for the copyright, bind it together, sell it somewhere. And I think you know, that has been, has been done for a long time, and I think we will see many, much more of that. And I think that's clearly that's a way to go. Essentially, you do your own textbook. And you, know, you can do that. You know, the, this modern technology, actually, it's, it's kind of relatively easy to do that. And, and so that's definitely, I think that's quite promising. Yes. You said some provocative things about textbooks, and um, I did hear a talk recently on James Flack Norris, who taught chemistry at MIT for many, many years, almost a century ago. But apparently his textbooks were famous, and they mentioned that he would write the textbooks in the summer in Maine, and he would take no notes with him. <laughs> because his theory was that students should only have to know in chemistry the kind of knowledge that a chemist would still remember because it was so mm -hmm. useful mm -hmm. that he or she was using it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's the way he made sure he didn't get off into yeah. uh, unimportant knowledge. Okay, so. that, that's a good point, yeah. Um, I wish more were written that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kinti. Sure. This was wonderful. We appreciate it. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.